Hi, my name is Yannick Pelletier and in this DVD I'm going to show and explain how to play the hedgehog system against the English opening. But before that, let me introduce myself in a few words. I'm a 40-year-old grandmaster from Switzerland and I have been living in France for about 10 years. I'm currently based in Paris with my family. I have won the Swiss individual championship five times and I have also won numerous open tournaments. Um, but I'm also actually a team player as um, I have been able to win the Swiss League uh, sometimes with the, my first club, Biel. Biel actu is actually uh, the, town, the town where I, I was born. Uh, that's a name, Biel, which you might know from the famous Biel Chess Festival, which has been taking place for almost 50 years now. And uh, more recently, I've also won a few titles with my new club, Zurich. I have uh, also won uh, the French League a few times with uh, Clichy and the German Bundesliga with Werder Bremen once as well. I have uh, represented Switzerland in, with the national team for almost 20 years, or even more than 20 years now, and um, I've been playing on the first board in the last few years. Last year, uh, last year in 2015, at the European Team Championship in Reykjavik, I managed to beat the world champion Magnus Carlsen using the hedgehog against the English. Um, yeah, I, I also speak several languages, um, and this DVD has been recorded not only in English, but also in German and in my mother tongue, French. Um, how is this DVD about the hedgehog system organized? How has it been structured? We are going to examine opening lines, different plans which are av available to, to white as well as to, to black in different uh, videos where I usually present a thematic game played by grandmasters usually. Um, but there is also one very important file, one important video about move orders, which I'm stressing it again, it is very important because I talk about how to reach our hedgehog system in the best conditions. Which first moves do we have to play, what should we avoid, what should we try to get. I also speak about plants in that small video. and. Um, there is another file which is important in this DVD. This is a, a database about uh, with with games played in the Hedgehog. I have chosen and selected all these games myself uh, so that they can teach you something. You you will get something by studying them as well. I have also commented and analyzed analyzed some of these games, especially for this DVD. And th I hope that thanks to this analysis, you will be able to improve your understanding of the system. Finally, there is also a few. There are also a few clips uh, on, you know, like interactive questions. I ask you questions, and you can answer them by by just moving on your screen, on the chessboard, on your screen. And by doing this, I'm sure you will be able to not only think about the questions I ask, but also try and improve your feeling, your understanding of the hedgehog. But what is the hedgehog actually? in chess. It's not just a small animal. Uh, when we talk about hedgehog in chess, we speak about a certain pawn structure, a certain uh, setup which black, usually black, adopts um, in order to face several openings. So basically the hedgehog is not just an opening as we could say the French defense or the Queen's Gambit. Uh, no, it, it's a setup, it's a system which can be reached universally against different uh, openings. For instance, you can get the hedgehog uh, against e4 in some lines of the Sicilian, or against d4, you can reach it through some lines of the Nimzo Indian. But generally, you will encounter a hedgehog against the English opening, against c4 or knight f3 on move 1. And one of the advantages of playing that with black, of choosing this setup with black, is that 
Well, let's say against d4, you you, you are a Grunfeld devotee, or you love playing the Benoni, you love playing the Nimzo Indian, or do I know? Um, sometimes you may feel frustrated when your opponent starts the game not with d4, but knight f3, or first move c4, and you cannot get your Benoni or your Grunfeld. You cannot uh, use the novelties you've prepared so carefully. And suddenly you're faced with a move like c4, knight f3, and uh, you may be sometimes, you may feel a bit at a loss on how to continue if you cannot get what you really love to do. And I'm suggesting here a universal system which can be used as well as against, against c4 on move 1 as against knight f3 on move 1, which, which shows flexibility. It's quite practical. Um, I was talking about pawn structure setup, so what is it exactly concretely about? Well, taking this diagram here, the first position, where I have removed all pieces except both kings, we can see the typical hedgehog structure which black has employed. But let's see first, let's mention first that you can see a pawn has disappeared from the body on each side. So very early in the game black has played c5 and later white went d4 and we exchanged those pawns on d4. These pawns have disappeared, opening some files. In the meantime, white has taken space here. On the, in the center, on the queen side with the c4 pawn. This is a basic uh, thing in, in the hedgehog. White is gaining space, but these pawns on c4 and e4 may sometimes be vulnerable, so black may be uh, well advised to try and attack them at some point. On his part, black has placed his pawns here on the 6th rank, on a6, b6, d6 and, a, and e6 and he can often he will also play g6. Well these pawns control very important squares here which I'm trying to highlight here with these arrows and these arrows actually remind a little bit of the spiny uh, of the spiny hedgehog. You know they, they are trying to protect everything like a hedgehog Put, rolling himself in, like in a bowl, trying to defend himself against possible attacks by an enemy. Well, this is probably uh, the reason why this setup has been called Hedgehog. Uh, but there are some features which basically the Hedgehog is, puts himself like this when he is attacked. And this is also the case for, for here in chess, but not only. I mean, the hedgehog is not just defensive. It's not based only on counter-attack, which is important too. But if white doesn't really know what to do with his pieces, how to attack, or doesn't feel the right moment to attack, then you can also, by yourself, try and be active. And we will see how a bit later. So... To sum it up, black puts himself on three ranks, you can see the 8th, 7th and 6th rank, but it doesn't mean he's only defensive and passive. Well, let's add some pieces now. Oh, I forgot to mention an important thing in the previous um, pawn structure, it's that um, we are going to look at the development of white's bishop here on g2 only, that is with g3, because this is the English opening and in this setup white tries to get c4, knight f3 and also g3, so put his bishop on the long diagonal. That's why we are, we are going to focus on this here and um, there are also some lines where white can play instead of g3, can play f3 and e4, and then this, the bishop doesn't go to g2, but comes to e2, we are not going to look at this here, because it goes beyond the scope of this opening setup here. Um, so f3 and, and bishop e2 can sometimes be reached in the Sicilian, for instance, in other English, but only if black is not very careful with his move order. So we have here the basic position, the basic setup that black employs in the uh, hedgehog. First of all, he puts his bishop on b7 on the long diagonal, where he exerts some pressure against 
e4 together with the knight here on f6. The bishop has been developed to e7, allowing castling here. And the second knight has been developed to d7. I'd like to stress this square d7, which is the ideal square for the knight. One may be tempted sometimes to put it on c6 instead, but you know, the, the square c6 is not ideal for the knight, it may be exposed, there may be tactical tricks which make this move knight c6 undesirable. So in the hedgehog, d7 is very often the best square for the knight. There may be an exception if black manages to exchange bishops first on the long diagonal, then sometimes the knight may come out to c6 advantageously. But this is yeah, we are going to see some cases through our videos, but for the moment keep in mind the knight belongs to d7 in general. Black will keep on playing moves to develop his position. He will bring his queen out to c7, connecting both rooks. The queen rook may go to c8 to occupy the semi-open file, or it may go to d8, also a useful square, and the other rook will go to e8, generally. Following bishop f8, a bis you can even try to reactivate the bishop on the long diagonal by putting it to g7, and this rook on e8 will play potentially an important part on that file, and this is also why you remove the bishop from this file. We'll talk about this a little bit later. And finally, once you have played queen c7, rook c8, you can also tr drop back with the queen to b8, where it feels a bit more safe. White, as I said, bishop g2, the usual development here. White has castled, developed his knight logically and naturally to c3, and the other knight has taken on d4, it has probably taken back the black pawn, which took from c5 to d4, so white knight on d4. This bishop may be developed to e3 or to b2 after b3. b3 is uh, usually quite useful in order to protect c4. As you can see, the bishop is no more on this diagonal. So c4 may demand protection and b3 is the natural way to do that. As we remember, the rook goes here, the queen goes here. So c4 needs protection. The queen will certainly go out somewhere and rooks will be connected towards the center. But how is white going to develop after that? What plan does he have at his disposal? Well, at the queen side, there is not too much he can do. Because if he plays b4, then c4 is badly weakened so that black can immediately start pressure against it. And if a4, we don't really see what this achieves for, for white. So basically he should turn his attention to the other side of the board, to the king side, and perhaps to the center. And the, the key move here to start being active with white is f4. You may then start launching an attack here against black's castle with g4 or g5. And this is very similar to what we see in the, Sim in the Sicilian, because the pawn structure is similar to we have c5 takes d4, occurred already, and the difference is that here in the English we have a pawn on c4, in the Sicilian this pawn is still on c2, so that, well, there are some differences, black can play b5 easier, and so on, but basically the plan to attack against black's king is valid here too. White can also turn his attention towards the center and try to push e5, for instance, or perhaps more dangerous could be f5 here. White starts putting pressure here against e6, which seemed to be well protected. It's not obvious to, to understand that this pawn on e6 is usually a critical, critical spot in black's position. If white manages to, you know, force black to take here on f5 or to push e5 after white has played f5, then white could be... Um, could be able to occupy this square on d5 with a knight or perhaps use the d5 to exert more and easier pressure against d6. 
So basically, this is what White generally likes to achieve um, against the hedgehog with White. And how can Black face this? Well, he's, first of all, I repeat, very well organized with his pieces, and in case he has already played something like Bishop F8, Rook E8, Bishop F8, G6, then at this moment when White plays F4, Black may be well advised, or is actually really well advised, to play e5 to counter himself immediately in the center. It may sound a little bit strange because we said that white would like to provoke e5 by playing f5, but here black should try to make sure that he's ready to play e5 just when f4 comes. By doing this, he will first of course, of course, attack the knight. He will be able to exchange on f4 maybe. And if he has a rook on e8 here, he will be able to increase pressure against e4, which will turn into a weakness. If white takes on e5, then black is able to install a nice knight on that square. But, alright, that's, that's a reaction by black to what white may be intending to do this pawn on f4. If white doesn't play f4 and waits, maneuvers, as some people like to do, Black is not doomed to passivity. He has two major pawn thrusts at his disposal, which he obviously has to prepare carefully by moves like, you know, bringing the rooks to the center, moving back the queen to b8 maybe. And these two main ideas for black are the pawn thrust b5 and the other pawn push d5. And actually, I'll explain why these two pawn moves may be so strong for black. And generally, I, I was speaking about the space advantage for white here, meaning that black has less space. And this is a, a big paradox of the hedgehog in, in, in chess in general. When you have less space, you usually have difficulties maneuvering, putting your pieces on right squares, you want to free your position by exchanging pieces. The hedgehog is exactly the contrary. Black's pieces are harmonious. They are well placed. They all have a function. And uh, they have no problem. They don't step on them, on each other, basically. And actually, black doesn't want to exchange pieces. If he does so, if it comes to an ending, Sometimes the black position may be critical because he has no space and white enjoys this space, this more advantage to increase the pressure. The hedgehog is a weapon, is a setup where you play for activity, not in the first moves of the game, but a bit later on. You're hoping to be able to develop an initiative in the middle game Thanks to the, these pawn thrusts, b5, d5, all your pieces are placed well, placed harmoniously. They, they have some kinds of ener energy in themselves, which only demands to display itself once the position opens. And if you manage to play d5 or b5 under favorable circumstances, suddenly your pieces will start radiating energy, energy and will, uh, will basically come out like two, three times stronger even. Often white is not organized to face that and is not ready to face that. And it's also the case when they play f4 and you counter with e5, suddenly your pieces start radiating. I think this is about it for the main ideas in this type of positions. I would like to add one thing which we can see in this position, again without pieces. The fact is that in this opening white is not forced to play e4. He can do it here, he can do it a bit later, he can postpone this move, or he can even uh, leave his pawn on e2 if he wishes to do so. And we have s small differences here. Basically, Black's ideas are the same. He's going to put his pieces the same way. He will try and make b5 work, d5 work. But there are some differences as, as concerns White's plans. First of all, 
because there is no pawn on e4, these bishops may be exchanged at some point. And white will generally try to put pressure against d6 when he, he, when he plays like this. He has several ways to do that and we are going to examine them one after the other in our clips uh, in this DVD. But I think it's important to say that there is also this pawn structure here without e4. I'd like to finish this introductory video by saying that I, I have played the hedgehog system. I've been playing it for about 20 years when I started studying it, learning it. I've always enjoyed playing it. I've done it with a kind of success. I have also tried to play this setup with white because I am also an English player as white so I've had to face the hedgehog myself with white so I know where dangers may lie, what are the most unpleasant setups, the most unpleasant variations. So it's also a DVD which can be interesting for white players against a hedgehog. And um, well generally I've always enjoyed playing it with black and it's kind of one of my pet uh, systems as black and I hope that I will be able to transmit not only my knowledge but also my passion for this opening.